students, writers, testers, program administrators. There's Ministry of Education people here interested in reading. If only there were more of you here. Anyway, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I look forward to the next two days to share stories and, and insights with you. I'd like to start out by deconstructing the title of my presentation because it is truly unusual for me to have a, a title of a presentation. It is the first in my life, my professional life, to have a title that is not very transparent. Usually my presentation titles are things like this. Building Reading Fluency, as transparent as can be. Or, I recently gave a paper called Writing Reader's Theater Scripts to Build Reading Fluency. Again, very transparent. So where the heck did this come from? I actually looked at this title, you know, about two months ago. I was like, what was I thinking? When I sent this to the conference organizers and I tried to reconstruct how I got here. And it all starts with 2008 when I was here in Dubai, the, the last and the first time actually, I was in Dubai for the TESOL um, Arabia conference. And we went on this sand dune wild ride. Uh, have any of you done that, this visit? Yeah, it's a wild ride, and those young men driving those SUVs have a great time, like scaring everyone in the car. And so, okay, we went in the sand dunes, and we got out of the SUV, we emptied the sand out of our boots, okay. And then we began the conference, and it was like constant interaction, networking, it was invigorating, and I was thinking at the time that the networking that occurred at TESOL Arabia was fruitful like an oasis, but there was also all this idea sharing. So it was productive like an oasis. So that's sort of the origins, the genesis of this crazy title that I have. I also have very positive um, associations with sand dunes in my own neck of the woods. I'm from California, and these are some sand dunes from California, the Death Valley National Park. And I, as a child, I went there almost every three Decembers, but with my family, my brothers and my parents. And it's like, let's go to the sand dunes. And we would go before the sun would rise. We'd climb to the top of the uh, tallest sand dune. And it was invigorating, and it was energizing. And we watched the sun come up. And uh, so I'm hoping, I already am feeling invigorated by this conference. So I'm hoping that you're feeling the same way. So my plan for today is to uh, do this, and I want to really, this could be like a 15-week semester course, but we've only got like 50 minutes, so we'll try to pack in as much as we can in the next 50 minutes. I want to briefly go over the benefits of extensive reading. Like many of us who presented yesterday, we start with the benefits of extensive reading. But then I want to turn to the naysayer reactions. There are quite a few people out there in the field who don't believe that what we're doing is effective. It's like, I don't believe it. We need to know what those people are saying so that maybe we can counter that to get more people on board with the benefits of extensive reading. So I'm going to go over naysayer reactions, and then I want to propose action research in local contexts as a way to gather data-driven evidence that we can use to turn those naysayer reactions around. And I'll talk about topics for action research, an action research process. Uh, I'll give you one model action research project and then close with some concluding remarks. And I'm hoping, in fact, that won't be the end, but the beginning of our conversation today and tomorrow. I'm lucky to be on early in the morning. Not so early, but I guess early for here. Uh, early enough in the morning that I can talk with you the rest of the day and tomorrow as well. Before we really get started, um, I want to remind you that this is going to be an inter, at different points, this is going to be an interactive plenary session. If you're not sitting next to someone, I urge you to move and sit next to someone because I'm going to ask you to do some activities with one another to help you begin defining some action research projects for your own local context. So thank you for moving over here, Paul. Christine, thank you for moving. 
This is good. <coughs> now I hear sort of an echo. Do you hear an echo? Should I? Is this gonna? Should I put it down a little bit? How's that? It sounds fine to you. Is that okay? Okay. So let's turn to a quick, quick overview of the benefits of extensive reading. As you all know, I mean, we know here that many studies have consistently shown that amount of reading, whether it's determined by time on task or number of words, number of pages, number of books, will lead to numerous benefits, including plentiful and meaningful L2 input, improved reading achievement, which might be uh, reported in terms of reading rate and reading comprehension. It might be vocabulary consolidation and growth. It might be improved motivation and attitudes towards reading, which is so important. And then, what the naysayers simply can't believe, and that is that extensive reading can also lead to improved listening, speaking and verbal fluency, grammar, writing, spelling, and cultural knowledge. This is sort of like a review of all the literature out there. Um, but the naysayers say, I don't buy it. Oops, they say, I don't buy it. Okay, all those amazing benefits, and they say, I don't buy it. What are their objections? Well, first of all, who are those naysayers? It might be the teacher next door to you at your school. It could be the language program administrator. It could be the, the Ministry of Education. Uh, and we, we, it could be the curriculum designers. It could be the researchers at your school. So we need to know what they're thinking. These are some of their objections. They say that some of our studies have just too few participants or that we don't report the number of participants. They say there are too few longitudinal studies, but I invite them to come to this conference. There are numerous longitudinal studies being reported in these three days here. Some of them, like seven years long, it's amazing. They say that we have an over-reliance on correlational data, superficial cause-effect relationships. They say that there are too few efforts at replication, too few reports of reliability, and this is one that always catches my attention. They talk about method methodological contradictions, and we know these. They say, you're promoting reading for pleasure, but at the same time, you're insisting on accountability measures. Pleasure and testing, pleasure, pleasure and assessment, it's like, I don't get it. Well, we understand the realities of our classrooms. Okay, but these are points that they make. They also talk about methodological contradictions like there's no comparison group. Or you're not reporting on the piloting of your instruments. Well, most of us do pilot our instruments. Maybe we should have a little paragraph in, in the report of our studies so that there aren't these objections. They also talk about the questionable relevance of the 10 universal principles of extensive reading by Dan Bamford. Well, interestingly, we ourselves are engaging in that very same conversation now. Go to the most recent Reading in a Foreign Language journal, and there's numerous discussions of the universal principles. There's going to be presentations at this conference on the same topic. Well, that's like a, an indicator of a really healthy growth of our field as we branch out into new classroom types with new students and new teachers. So of course, thank goodness we're, we're taking a look at those universal principles. Um, and they say that there's limited research on classroom pr procedures and practices and what we report is often anecdotal. We just need to know what they say. But they don't stop there. They say, uh, we can't, I don't buy it, but I can't do it. They say, number one, there's no time in the curriculum. They say that we're happy with what we're doing. People resist leaving the comfort of the status quo. Okay, they say that there's too much work to set it up, too much record keeping, too much oversight. They say it's too costly to buy those little graded readers. The graded readers that our students do so well, it's too costly, those little books. 
And they say it's not what we expect of our teachers. We want communicative classrooms that are noisy. We want the teachers to close the doors. We want to see students working in groups. That's what the essence of a language classroom is. And they also say that we give our students what they want. Students don't like to read, so we don't ask them to read. Isn't that horrifying? Okay. Uh, they say uh, we, we need to keep our enrollments up. So students say they don't want to read, so we're not going to ask them to read. We're going to. Some of you are nodding your heads. We've got to turn that around, I'll tell you. We've got a lot of work to do. And I want to propose that we can do some of that work in the, with action research in local contexts, in our own classrooms, with our own students, in our own schools. So what I'm not proposing here, not because they aren't good, I'm not proposing large-scale, longitudinal studies with huge numbers of participants, but I'm proposing today, rather, local action research in the confines of your own classroom, maybe with another teacher, and with research questions that are so narrow, because you have a lifetime to engage in action research, so narrow that it really is something you can fit into your busy schedules. Because we teachers are, are we busy? Yes, we're busy. Now you know that action research comes from, uh, takes its name from two dimensions that are central to it. On the one hand, we have research, which is the data gathering component designed to illuminate an issue or a problem. And action on the other side where we actually take steps, concrete steps, to improve our classroom practices. This is in general terms. Another way to think about action research is to uh, view it as teacher, this is in general terms, teacher-initiated inquiry, during which teachers look critically at their own classrooms, their own students or themselves to improve their teaching and enhance the quality of learning that takes place there. So this is in very general terms, but today I want to focus on action research in the context of extensive reading specifically. And you know that again, within our ex extensive reading classrooms, we can look at ourselves, we can look at our students, we can look at subsets of students, we can look at the graded readers in our library, we can look at our pre-reading, during reading, and post-reading activities. We can look at our accountability measures. But we can't do it all at once. It's too much with all that we have to do, so we have to keep it narrow. It's often the case that we guide our, the focal point of our action research about topics that we could say, I'm interested in X, or I'm concerned about X, I'm eager to try something out that I might hear at a conference or read about in a new book on extensive reading, or I'm puzzled by it. And I invite you now to begin thinking about how you would fill in these blanks, <coughs> thinking about your own extensive reading classrooms. And if you're not yet teaching extensive reading and you're here because you're curious about it, think about what you might, the questions you might ask yourselves if you were, in fact, to get an extensive reading program started. I've also met some of you who aren't doing reading. You're writing teachers. Well, you can, you can focus on your own context, because we can all engage in action research to move ourselves forward. I do action research every single semester. I have engaged in action research every single semester of my professional not always with extensive reading, right now with my methods class, my methods of teaching reading and writing. And I pose a question at the beginning of every year to just help me stay vibrant, stay on top of things, be responsive to my ever-changing group of students that are in my classes. So you just remember, have to remember you have a lifetime. If I were to do an action research project right now within the context of extensive reading, I might focus on one of these three topics. Why? I'm concerned about our book checkout procedures. It takes way too much time. Students are not, could be reading more if we were only more time efficient. And we're losing some books. Or I could focus on uh, some brand new pre-reading tasks that I just read about. 
Why? Because I'm eager to try out something new to diversify what I do in the classroom and better reach my students. Or I might look at my target goal. Not for the best students in the class. Let's say the target goal in terms of amount read. Let's say you state 215,000 words by the end of the semester. I'm not worried about my most motivated students. They always go beyond 215,000 words. I'm always worried about my weak students, and I'm always going to be encouraging them. But right now, I'm most curious about those students who will comply with my stated goal, 215,000 words for the semester. And when they get there, they stop. And it might, we might have to. Have you, do you have any students like that? Yeah. Whatever you say, teacher, I'm done at, at, at week 13, two more weeks to go, and I'm just going to coast. I don't want them to coast. Clearly, they could accomplish more. So I'm sort of curious about a more flexible expectation that would accommodate that middle ground, the students that will comply and then coast when they reach our target. I'd like you now to, this is your turn now, I'd like you to think about what you would focus on if you were to start an action research project in your own classrooms and think about, just fill in on the top page of your handout, the top box on page one, fill in three areas of interest. Jot them down. Does everyone have a handout? Yeah. Um, you need a handout? Here you go. Oh, please go. Fill out three areas of interest, and then uh, turn to your neighbor and just share your ideas with your neighbor. I'm going to give you 1.5 minutes. It's probably true that your ideas for action research probably fall into one of these areas. Just take a look at this and just think, do yours fall in one of these areas, one or more of these areas?
what is extensive reading, this is extensive reading. I wouldn't say to students, why are we doing it? But I would explain, sorry, it's not like question, answer, question, answer. But in my introduction, I would want to make sure that I answer these questions. And what I might do is tape record myself and then listen to the questions that students ask and jot some journal entries just so the next semester, the next year, I can improve my, in, I can improve my introduction to extensive reading based on the questions that students ask. It's not quite that simple, though, because students might not ask questions that very first day, but they might ask questions a few days later or a few weeks later. So I would keep this journal open to jot a few things down so that I could improve my introduction the next semester. Now, I want to just make a quick comment about that last question there. What are my student interests to guide graded reader recommendations? There have been numerous articles written in the field that said during that all-important introduction, find out what your students' interests are. Because one of our important roles can be to make recommendations to students. And it's not like, what do you read? Because maybe they aren't reading. What's your favorite TV show? What do you like to do in your free time? Who's your favorite actor? Uh, we need to find, get some, gather some information around our students so that we can guide them to the books that will motivate them the most in our graded reader library. So that could be one part of your introduction. Another possible action research project, have you heard about this reading for pleasure pedagogy? It's actually a a group of people in the first language world, and I'm referring to Safford 2014, it's in my reference list. She talks about, and the people in content-based instruction talk about this as well, creating a print-rich environment in our classrooms. Putting things on the walls, and if you can't put things on your walls, teachers are going out into the corridors of their schools to create English-rich print environment in their corridors. What this Safford proposes what she calls extreme reading photos. You've heard of extreme sports? Well, she has whole schools, staff, teachers, students, and parents going out and just taking pictures in the real world of people reading in extreme circumstances, like one of her examples is the mechanic underneath the car who isn't reading the car manual, but reading a fun book. And putting that on the wall. You can actually Google extreme reading photos, and you'll find, not context specific, but pictures that schools, whole schools have taken of people reading in extreme circumstances, and they're putting them in the classroom. I'm so curious about this. It's just an interesting idea. So that they got, um, well, this is a definitely a U.S. picture, but kids on the beach covered in sand up to here, reading a book. Okay. They're cute pictures, but like catching the like saying to your students, you can read anywhere under any circumstances. I'm sort of curious about this extreme photos, and I might ask myself, how responsive are students to photos of extreme reading when they walk into or leave the classroom? And I probably would have a seating chart, and I would just, you know, get to class early as I always do, and just, just annotate who's looking at the pictures, the interactions that are, occur, to know what kinds of pictures I want to put up on the walls in the future. I love the idea. Give it a try. Email me and let me know how your students do. Now, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, the teacher role in the extensive reading. You should all be thinking about this, of course. What is our role? And actually, our roles are changing recently. You remember during the, uh, well, during the days when sustained silent reading was not being uh, challenged by the scaffolded silent reading folks, I used to, I spent, I loved uh, the sustained silent reading when they said, be a role model and read silently while your students are reading. Wow, I got so much reading done. All my economists and all the stuff I love to read, I would do it in class. Okay, and I'd leave class, I'm 
broken. Wow, I finished another magazine. Well, the scaffold that silent reading people now say, maybe you could be a role model in another way. Maybe it's better to be a guide, coach, cheerleader. Well, Mark, you talk about being a cheerleader. Monitor, motivator, or resource. And so we serve a slightly different role in the classroom. Maybe you should look at yourself. What role are you playing? I might ask this question. Uh, no, look, before I tell you my question, I want you to think about two action research questions that you might pose about your role in your extensive reading classroom. Jot down two questions, turn to your neighbor and share them, and then I'm going to share with you my question. I'm going to give you one minute, so do this quickly. We have a lot to cover. Let me share my, I have two possible questions. One is, and I'm trying to keep it narrow, how do I share my enthusiasm for reading with my students? Now that I'm not reading silently anymore with them, what do I do on Monday morning when I walk into class? What do I, how do I share with them what I've been reading over the weekend? And to get them to be interested and hope that my enthusiasm for reading carries over. So I might look at myself, or I could say, what are some effective ways for engaging with students one-on-one -on -one, uh, during extensive reading? That's the sort of scaffolded, silent reading that's being proposed in the literature. Walking around and asking your students quietly not to disturb everyone in the classroom. What do you read? How do you like it? Who in the classroom? Who else in the classroom might want to read this book? When you're finished with this book, you want to read something similar. These are ways to scaffold instruction, and I might observe myself and just see which of those questions have a good response, a meaningful response from the students in my class. Do you think this is manageable? You need to keep them narrow. You've got a lifetime, remember, to do this. You could also look at pre-reading activities that you're doing, or you could do while reading or post-reading activities. Um, how about if you think about the post-reading activities that you do in your extensive reading classrooms, just pose a question or two. Just do one because of time. And then I'll share with you what I would ask myself right now. now you know, this is some, what I'm asking you to do is a little artificial because typically when we propose a question for action research, it emerges from within based on what we're seeing in the classroom. I just want you to begin to think of all the different aspects of action of extensive reading that we can ask ourselves questions about. This might be my question. I'm like intrigued by, you know the um, uh, Ken Schmidt's blurb and title match activity. Have any of you used that to introduce students to? Well, Ken Schmidt actually proposes that students uh, read aloud the blurb to their partner and then look for matches. I want to, I'm curious about converting his idea into something that would entail more silent reading. So instead of reading aloud, I want them to be reading the blurb and then maybe not with a partner, uh, but on their own to read the blurb and then match the blurb with a book title. So I, I'm going to keep it narrow. I'm only going to look at this particular activity because I like it. But I want to just sort of diversify and add some variety to my classroom and promote more silent reading. And so I'm just going to monitor myself and all the different ways in which I adapt this activity. And I'm going to share those ideas with my colleagues. Finally, this is something well, I did years ago. I didn't know it was action research. but. Um, I found myself in a new job at the University of Southern California. They had graded readers, but they weren't doing much with them. And I really wanted to get an extensive reading program going. I needed to do an inventory. We may think of it as just doing an inventory. I say it's a form of action research to understand the resources that you have available, to answer a question, what's available, and I'm now going to go to the director of my program and ask with very specific reasons for money to augment the collection. Because if you just walk into 
your principal's office or to the director's office and say, we need more graded readers, most administrators are not going to just hand over some money. But if you can say we have only this number of detectives, this number, this number of mysteries, this number of love stories, we are missing informational text for students that like nonfiction. I think you're more likely to get support from your administrators when you have data. So this is a form of action research. How many of you are teachers? This is worthwhile. I'll tell you, if we want the next generation of teachers to teach extensive reading, we need it to introduce it to them in their master's degree programs. Uh, just do a review of syllabi. You'll be astounded to find out how little attention is given to extensive reading. This is an interesting topic, of course. I'm going to, because of time, I'm going to just share with you my questions instead of giving you a turn. How do students' attitudes toward reading change from start to finish in the semester pre and post? There's so many different ways to gather information. And to what extent do reluctant student readers become more motivated to read by charting their progress on individual student record keeping sheets? I'm not going to focus on the whole class. I'm going to focus on a subset of my students. That's a question as well. I became very interested in this notion of extensive listening and extensive reading yesterday. I'd like to go back and propose to our intensive English program that we consider making a dual commitment to extensive listening and reading. This would probably be my question. And it's exciting because so many graded readers these days are coming out with accompanying audio tapes. I would probably propose three different classes, one without audio tapes, one in which we do silent reading, then use the audio tape, another classroom where we do the audio tape and the silent reading, gather data, and come up with some evidence for doing it one way or the other. I'm going to try that. I'll let you know how it works. Go back to your list. Uh, that you made at the very beginning of this session, and in which categories do your questions fall? Just take 30, 30 seconds to look at your topics to see where they fall. It may be that they fall into more than one of these categories. Anticipate what your outcomes are. 
What are you going to learn from posing this question and taking the time to gather data? If you don't have any clue what you might learn from this action research project, I would suggest that you revise your question. And then we're going to specify types of data to collect. It might be qualitative with an interview. It might be or a, a teacher journal, or it might be quantitative or a combination of the two. You're going to determine ways to collect data. And if you look at page three of your handout, if you look at page three of your handout, you'll see that there's different ways to collect data. This is sort of your homework. You can take a look at this page three. Actually, most of the handout you can look on your own. You know, you, this is the homework I'm going to assign tonight. And you know, when you specify ways to collect data, you could try to come up with ways that were not going to really interfere much with your classroom. It's what you normally would be doing anyway. We do have some invade, more invasive ways when we bring a questionnaire into class, we're losing class time. You just need to know that. And then there are many ways to collect data that have nothing to do with classroom, the classroom, checking out your, your graded readers. And so you may need to decide. That may be a deciding factor on how you're going to proceed. And then you always want to consider time-related factors. Well, you're going to narrow down your topic so it doesn't take too much time. You do need to recognize that when you make a commitment to action research, it is going to take some time. And when you sort of consider how much time do I have to do to get ready while well, gathering data, while well, analyzing data, you may want to narrow it down even further to make it feasible and manageable. This is when it really begins. Steps one through six are the planning phases. In step seven, you're going to um, collect data systematically. How data are collected and how often are variable variable but consistency, uh, careful, regular, systematic collection is what's really important. And then, of course, after you gather the data, uh, you're going to uh, assemble, examine, and analyze your data for patterns. If you look at page four of your handout, you'll see some ideas for data analysis techniques. Again, since I always loved, there's some of my past students here, you know that I love to give homework, is that true? <laughs> I love to give, so I'll give you homework as well. And then, steps 9, 10, and 11, you're going to uh, reflect on findings. This is the fun part. But what we're really aiming for is step 10. We're going to generate practical solutions, whether it means a change in our own behavior or a change in our teaching techniques. And then we're going to experiment with them, and the cycle begins again. Once you make a commitment to action research, it's like a lifelong habit that you can't get out of. It's quite exhilarating, because you're always trying to understand your extensive reading classroom a little better, and make it better as a result of what you find out. So many people stop here, but not those of you at this conference. Many of you are actually reporting the results of your action research projects on the program here. And that's why step 12 is the final stage. In the teacher's room, at lunch, at the Extensive Reading Foundation, at TESOL Arabia, at TESOL, this is where we share our ideas. So not only do we benefit in our students, but the field benefits. And we move everyone forward. And so that's the cycle. Now, if you look at page, the last page of your handout, I just want to tell you about, very quickly, a, a model action research project that I, I want to engage in. Is ben, Fen ben Fenton Smith here? I wish I knew you. Does anyone know Ben Fenton Smith? He wrote this great article on materials development about book reaction papers that you do, and he gives students 26 different options. And I only have a subset on that last page of your handout. 
I'm so curious to know how this, these would work with my students. At 26 options? That's a lot of reading, just reading the prompts. I'm, I have so many questions I want to ask. I'm just going to show you some of my questions. These are some of my questions I might ask about his, his book reaction reports. But I can't answer, I can't ask them all. I have to choose one. Only one. And if you look at these questions, they lead to very different types of action research projects. In number, number one, I look at myself. In number two, I look at my graded readers. In number three, I think I'm going to divide the set into two and do this in two different classes. In number three, I'm going to keep a tally of which students gravitate towards which action research report prompts. And in number five, I'm going to create a timeline. And I might be able to, with gathering just data for one of these questions, I might be able to make use of his really good ideas. So, we've almost come to the end here. I really want to invite you, not to do this action research project, although I think I want to do this with the teachers that are in our intensive English program, because you can do this collaboratively. A lot of collaborative action research projects in Australia. We should follow their lead. I want to invite you to come up with a question that is important to you. And maybe with a colleague if you want. And explore some aspect of extensive reading to make yourself a better teacher, to give your students a more enriching experience, or to improve the program in which you work. And then share your ideas at the next Extensive Reading Congress, wherever we meet, again, and move the field forward. Your homework for tonight is to read the handout more carefully. <laughs> and I'm hoping that the handout itself will give you some ideas and the energy to, and the systematic way in which you can engage in action research. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy not to entertain questions here, but at any time during the conference in the coming days. So thank you for being a great audience.